<laughs> Thank you so much for, for watching and supporting Archbold. A lot of the musicians the last few months have been doing live streams too. And just like a musician needs an audience, a nature guide also needs an audience. Well, this is a very special pond that I've brought you to because this is the pond that we bring our summer campers to every year. And it's a little different than most of the other ponds because it's a little deeper and it's wet all year round. It is a seasonal pond because it does fluctuate, the water level fluctuates a lot up and down from year to year based on the rainy seasons. It's the beginning of the rainy season, so right now I'm, down, I'm up to my knees, up to my knees in the water. But some years, a real wet year, uh, at the, like in, into July, I'll be out here this high on my stomach, which is pretty amazing. This is Muskrat Pond or uh, Neofiber Pond, which is the Latin name for the Florida muskrat. And I have had the fortune of once actually seeing a muskrat out here. The Florida muskrat lives in these kind of ponds and uh, makes little, uh, little dens in the grass, just pretty awesome. I'm gonna turn my camera around so you can all get the same beautiful view that I have. And just like in other virtual field trips, you'll have the chance to write in the chat. So throughout this whole virtual field trip, write observations about the things that you see. We do have special guests on today um, that won't have, their won't have their camera on, but we have our summer campers, our virtual summer campers are on too. And we have virtual campers coming from all over the country. So campers, Make sure you got your keyboard out, and I really want to see those comments in the, in the chat area. Uh, and that goes for everybody else, too. This is an all-age virtual field trip. I'm going to turn my camera around. Here we go. Here's the view I'm looking at. Let me get down low. Just gorgeous right here. Let's, uh, let's see some... I noticed statements in the chat. Those of you from Florida that are wilderness people might be thinking, oh yeah, that's a view I've seen many times and it gives you lots of warm, fuzzy feelings. But people from other parts of the country, um, and I know we do have some, some viewers from the UK, might be thinking, wow, that, that looks really different. I've never seen anything like that. What do you notice here? How would you describe this habitat to somebody? I don't know if anybody here can recognize any of the plants that we're seeing, or maybe some observations about the water. Some water lilies. Yeah, I'll talk about those in a couple minutes here. Someone said they're worried about gators. I'm gonna switch this back to me. Let me address uh, the gator in the room for a moment. Yes, I am in Florida and I'm in a wetland. So there is the potential to have alligators out here. But I have been coming out here for many years and I've actually never seen a gator in this pond. There's some little small fish that live in here but I think there's just, I just think it's, there's not enough food in here. Uh, we have a lake just, you know, a couple miles that way, and that's where the gators seem to like to hang out. <laughs> so don't be worried for me. I should be okay. I'm going to get a little closer to these trees in front of me and show you um, a little more of an up-close view of some of these plants that are here. But as I'm walking, and I'll try not to fall, uh, when you're walking through here, there's a mucky bottom, and it's all this dead vegetation, and you never know when all of a sudden you're gonna go whoop <laughs> into a little hole. <laughs> so I'm gonna slow, slowly make my way over to these trees over here. Uh, but yeah, this, this is a pond in the middle of the Florida scrub. It doesn't seem like it, but if I started walking in just about a minute in any direction, 
all of a sudden I would be in Florida scrub habitat, which feels more like a desert, very dry and sandy. Those of you who were, who were on last week saw me out there. Um, and yet our property is dotted with hundreds of little ponds. I am now getting up to the trees here. In the middle of this pond is this beautiful stand of Sweet Bay Magnolia. I don't know how well it's gonna come out um, on the video here, but if I get a little closer, you can see that the underside of these Sweet Bay leaves is a nice silver. And they are, they are magnolias. Many of you will be familiar with uh, the Southern magnolias. These ones look a little bit like bay trees, sweet bay magnolia. And their, their bark and leaves have been used as a traditional medicine um, to treat all kinds of things like uh, malaria and arthritis. I'm gonna go, <laughs> I'm gonna plot myself Right down in the water here, uh, there's something that I saw earlier. See if I can find it again. Here it is, right here. I'm gonna plot myself down because I wanna talk about these, these uh, yellow water lilies here. They're also called spatter docks. Try not to get my, can't, my backpack too wet. Uh, unfortunately, none of them are in bloom right now. But these, these spatter docks have a really pretty yellow flower. I found a couple of buds. So let me get up close. See if we can see this. Right here, this little bud. And this, this flower is not going to grow, grow um, up. And in fact, this is not a real showy flower. Once it does open, it will still be pretty small but it will be a, just a beautiful little yellow flower. And when you're out here a little later in the summer, this, you can see behind me, there's a whole lot of these and it is just beautiful out here in the summer, a little later in the summer. I brought with me a, a glass collecting jar. Here we go. I want you to see this water. Check out what I'm looking at here. If you've ever done much traveling in the South, this is going to look real familiar. Uh, it, looks, it looks like tea, because it kind of is. <laughs> uh, there's no tea uh, trees around here, but uh, what, what you've got is stained water, stained from the, the tannins from the trees around here. We have oak trees and pine trees, and they are making essentially a tea so the water here is very dark, very dark. When I bring campers here for their first year of camp, it is an experience because they, they're excited. I tell them about the pond, they get very excited and they say, oh, we're gonna come out and look for tadpoles and fish and all kinds of good stuff. And once they get out here and they see that this water is almost black, I uh, mean, it's just opaque. Uh, you cannot see through it more than a, just a couple inches. That's when some of them turn back around and say, I don't know about this, Mr. Dustin. Uh, but it's, it's just one of those things that makes me feel like, yes, that's right. I'm here in Florida. This is a very Florida habitat. Around me are lots of little tadpoles and even lots of young frogs. I'm seeing little frogs all over the place, little tree frogs. And let's see if I can, maybe I can even catch one. I just, they all just swam away because I've been plopping down in the water here. But let's see, I see one right there. I'm just gonna try to scoop him up. Did I get him? Nope, I'll try again. I see another, well, they're all over the place. There we go. 
you might see this little tadpole swimming all around and you could you can see that that did, that only took two tries because this pond is full of life full of life it, there are so many tadpoles in here i don't even know how, how to how you even count them my goodness uh, I came out here a few days ago with my wife, bio, who's a biologist, and we came out with some nets to try to see if we could catch some tadpoles or some macro invertebrates. Uh, so if we could catch like dragonfly larvae and things like that. And I made a little video. This is about two minutes long. And I really, I'm excited to show you what we found. We were only out here for an hour, maybe an hour and a half. And even in just that short time, we're able to find some cool stuff. So we're gonna pull the video up. Um, So what was that? There was a whole bunch of stuff we found. Uh, I saw some people were saying, what was that black stuff in Emily's hand? Tadpoles, <laughs> lots and lots and lots of tadpoles. <laughs> you get the idea that, uh, yeah, there's a lot of them out here. She, <laughs> she had her whole, she, she swiped her net. So we brought, we brought a net out. Hers was a little smaller than this. And with one swipe, she got all of those tadpoles she had in her hand. The dragonfly at the end there was a dragonfly that we saved because it had gotten stuck in the water. It couldn't get out. So we pulled it out of the water. You could see it trying to fly. What it didn't get on tape is that Emily actually separated its wings because they were stuck together. And it started to dry off a little bit and woo, <laughs> flew away. But there was some other cool stuff in there. Right in the chats, if you recognize any of the other critters that were in that video. And I know some of them probably looked familiar, like you may have recognized the mealworm. Uh, someone said a stick bug. That was a water scorpion. It looks a lot like a stick bug and they are predators down there. I started the video off with the tadpoles and then after the tadpole, pretty much everything else is a predator that eats tadpoles <laughs> that was in the video, uh, aside from the little mealworm. The, the, uh, the little critter that was long and crawling on um, Emily's hand with just like the strangest looking body kind of stuck its tail up in the air, that's called a water tiger. And it is the larva of 
um, a, a beetle out here called a predaceous diving beetle. When we first found that, I, I wasn't sure what it was. I've seen predaceous diving beetle larva before, but there's different species. I hadn't seen that one before. The other um, close up of the little uh, long elongated critters in the water was another water tiger, just a different, different species of water tiger. But yeah, pretty fun stuff. And you don't have to come to, you know, a pristine pond like this to, to do this kind of thing. You can, you can just go to a ditch near your house and you can start finding all kinds of, some of the same things. Uh, so, we, so we did that, we came out, we, we looked for macroinvertebrates, uh, but we wanted to see if we could get anything besides that, something a little bigger. So, I came, so we set out some minnow traps and let me show you what they look like. Some of you may have used these before. It's a minnow trap or a fish trap. The animal swims in through the little hole there and then they just can't find their way back out. So it's non-lethal. And then you just open it back up and, and let, the, let the animal go. I set three of these out last night, uh, hoping we would have something today we could show you live. Uh, I didn't get anything. <laughs> it's a good thing that I came out the last couple days and made another little film for you. So uh, we're going to pop up this other film. It's, this one's about seven minutes long. Again, feel free to make comments in the chat as the video is going along. And if you have ever done any, any um, trapping with minnow traps, let us know in the chat. So we're going to get the video. Whoop, <laughs> we're going to get the video up for you. My first time ever setting fish traps. So I've asked my friend Alan Rivera to come out here with me. <laughs> you can see we're socially distancing out here and he's going to check the traps while I film. So let's see what we got. We have some tadpoles in here. There's Scorpion bug. In the traps, we found a lot of tadpoles, and we did get a water scorpion, but Alan and I were both hoping for a little bit more. So he is going to reset the traps, and I will come out tomorrow morning and give this another try. He's going to give us a couple of tips for how he places his traps. Hopefully, with his experience, his spots will be better than mine. A lot of ecologists and biologists use drift nets and drift fencing to kind of corral animals to go into a trap. We can't put drift fencing in here, but we can utilize natural areas of, that we could fake as a drift net fence. So this log acts like a nice little barrier. I like to have one end of the trap on the ground. So that way anything that crawls on the ground, a lot of, a lot of small turtles like to crawl on the ground, um, as well as amphiumas and sirens, so we did set a trap here before, and I liked it, uh, but I think we can make it a little better. So you see this little opening here? Seems like a nice spot for stuff to hang out. It's not much, but it's something we can work with. So I'm going to lay down a trap. It's shallow enough here that I'm not even worried about a flotation, and it's not supposed to rain. So I think we'll be okay. Yesterday, we caught tadpoles and a water scorpion. I'm back again this morning. Let's see if we found anything different. More tadpoles. <laughs> A whole lot of tadpoles. Tadpoles. Let's lift it up and see if we've got anything here. We just hit the mother low. <laughs> We've got something pretty cool right here. Any guesses? What could this little beastie be? <laughs> this is a giant salamander called an amphiuma. Um, I'm going to go check the other traps and I'll come back here and put my phone on the tripod and uh, let him out of the cage. <laughs> it 
if I could have picked one thing to find out here this morning, it would be a two-toed amphiuma right here. There are mud turtles, there's water snakes, and we could have caught both of them in this little minnow trap, but this is what I was hoping for. Uh, I am a little nervous because I've never handled one of these before. They can bite. They also are very slimy. I have a net and I'm going to open this up and try to get him into the net so you can see what he looks like a little bit better. I'm going to open the cage and try to get him to go in the net. I don't know, I don't know if this is going to work. He's moving around. He might just take right off, and the water's behind me, so he might just slither right back in the water. Amphiumas look a lot like an eel. They do have little legs. They're giant salamanders. I put these traps out overnight because I know this is a nocturnal animal, and I was hoping we would catch one when I came out here in the morning. They live down in the mud, and they eat all kinds of stuff down there. Uh, there's lots of tadpoles in there right now, so they eat those little fish. Um, there are some small crayfish in this pond too, so they'd eat those as well. Let me unhook the trap. And let's see. Hold this right in front of me. And open this up. If we're lucky, he'll stay in there for a second before running off. I can see his slime, that, that's a defense. He's produced a lot of slime. I see little bubbles all over the place. There you go. There you go, right there. Can you see him? There he is. Take a look at our new friend here. He's looking around, he's gonna exit pretty quick. You can see his face, he's about to, his head's right over here. There he is. He can breathe out of the water. This is not a fish, it's not an eel. He has lungs. Oh, wow. Can you see his eyes? Beautiful, beautiful. I'm gonna move my <laughs> hands out of the way because they do, they do have teeth, and I have heard that they can give a pretty nasty bite. I don't want to take them out of the water for too long, so I'm going to stick them back in there, and um, wow, wow, <laughs> very cool. I put our Amphiuma friend away, and I'm about to take off. Thank you all for joining me on this adventure, setting fish traps and seeing what we found. Sometimes people ask me, what is the coolest thing that you've seen in nature? And I think the Amphiumo wins that. Uh, I don't know if you could see, sometimes on the video you could see the tiny little legs. <laughs> That's why people always think it's an eel. Sometimes people call it a Congo eel. Uh, but it does have tiny little legs on there. Uh, well, I'm still excited. <laughs> it was two days ago. I'm still very excited about it. The, uh, the, the last thing I want to do out here before we get to questions and answers is just uh, kind of geek out a little bit over these plants that are behind me. I, I just think they're super cool. These are called um, lance arrowheads, lance leaf arrowheads. And you can see why they get their name. I mean, they look like the old you know, ancient weapon of a lance. and um, kind of like an arrowhead too. Some of them are flowering and they are covered in honeybees. Of course, now I just scared all the honeybees away because I was grabbing it, but I'm gonna try to show you the flower. I'm gonna turn this around. Beautiful flowers and the honeybees are back. Hopefully I can get this in focus for you. Try to zoom in a little bit. I wonder what the honeybee, uh, what the honey tastes like from these. 
doesn't look like we're going to get that in, in great focus. Uh, but gosh, I'd be curious to have the, the honey from these. There's honeybees on there. There's also little flies that are bright green and they have kind of zebra stripes on them too, which uh, I don't know, I don't know what they are. I, one of the reasons I like these is because they have an amazing cultural history. They're also called wapato plants. They, that's the, um, the whole genus of Sagittaria, which is what these are. And this one's Sagittaria lancifolia, I think. <laughs> uh, and they have, they have tubers in the ground. So they're also called duck potatoes. I tried this the other day. I tried to harvest some and it did not work out. But there, there's another species that's very similar. That's the one that's used more often for its, for its food. And what the, uh, what the Native Americans do and have been doing for a long, long time to harvest it is go out to a swamp or a marsh and uh, just start kind of doing that with your feet. You know, you come out here barefoot Where's my favorite <laughs> And just kind of uh, move around to free up the roots, and these little tubers will break off and float to the surface. You can eat the tubers. Um, I've read that you can also eat the fresh stalks before they bloom as well. I'm not sure how you have to prepare them though. But once you get those tubers, they're basically a potato. And you could cook them, eat them just like a potato, which is pretty amazing. I don't know about you, but sometimes I make the mistake of when I'm visiting a natural area like this, of feeling like I'm the first person to ever be here. And like it's all new and just for me. It's really important that we acknowledge the cultural history. People have been living in Florida for over 10,000 years and interacting with these species. So the sweet bay I showed you before used as medicine. These used as food. Um, and that, that goes back so far. And coming out here, experiencing nature is a way to uh, connect with that history and remind ourselves of that history. But with that, I wanna go to the question and answer section. Oh, oh I forgot one thing I wanted to say. I mentioned that this was muskrat pond. The muskrats love the tubers for these. And, you know, I'm thinking, I mean, there's a whole field, a whole field of these arrowheads here. So it's a good place if you want to be a muskrat. They, they will hoard the tubers. And there's stories of uh, Native Americans used to go and raid the pantries of the muskrats to get those to get those tubers, which is pretty cool. Uh, the Latin name for the Florida muskrat is Neofiber alani. So it's good that we have Alan, he, who was with me to set the traps, he's waiting too. So Alan, if you wanna pull up your video and, and uh, unmike yourself, you can get on here too. He's a research assistant at Archbold, but he also has been coming to this pond his whole life because he is a former summer camper. Hey, Alan, there you are. Hey, Dustin. So we're gonna see if we have any questions. Laura, it looks like I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing that we've got some. Can you feed Alan and I some questions here? Sure. Give me just a minute because I'm having trouble with my computer screens. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, excellent. We can hear you. All right. The first one is from Zeke. He says, why is the water so deep? This is a spot where, yeah, the water is a lot deeper than the, the other areas. And I, know, I don't know exactly why, but my guess would be that all of these ponds have the same, um, whether they have a mucky bottom or a sandy bottom, they have the same um, starting point, which is they are, little dips in the topography. Little spots where the land is just a little bit lower than the land around it. So the rainwater will gather in those depressions. And 
my guess is that this one is just a little bit of a deeper depression. Um, but I'm happy to be wrong on that if someone knows a better reason why this one would be deeper. Excellent. Oliver from the UK would like to know how hot it is here. I didn't check. It's, it's in the 80s, I'm sure. Uh, with my feet in the water, it feels really good. Uh, it feels perfect, actually. But when I start walking, walking back to get out of here, I'm, I'll be sweating quite a bit, I'm sure. <laughs> there's, you know, there's the heat, but there's also the humidity. So in Florida, when you tell people, oh, it's 88 or it's 92 degrees, they think, oh, that sounds hot. But the humidity makes it much more difficult because it feels like you're walking through soup and you're just sweating and sweating, covered in water, but it's not evaporating. Yep, according to my phone, it says it's 80 degrees Fahrenheit, but it feels like 83, and it's just going to go up from there. That's why we're filming this in the morning. <laughs> All right, one more question about the water there. How deep are you in the water? I'd say right in this spot, a foot, a little over a foot. But if I walked around through here, I would find spots that were another foot or so deep. There's one spot in particular that's caught me off guard multiple times where I'm walking and all of a sudden, poof, I drop down an extra foot. But I have been here uh, uh, other years and later in the, in the rainy season when it is up mi midway up my, uh, up my stomach, uh, just under my chest. Wow. We have a question about the tannin from Gail. She says, what do trees use tannin for? I think it's just uh, to protect it from insects. Uh, I don't know what else it does. Uh, Alan, do you have any, any uh, that? Yeah, I think it, they're mainly just protectants for insects and for different plant species. Um, and it's, I know that tannins are stored in the bark to help protect them from fungi too, and from bacteria, but I'm not sure what else. I'm not sure if they have an antibiotic, um, you know, part of them, or if it's just that they're really bitter. I'm not sure. I'd love to learn more about that. About the chemical. Okay. Nicole on Facebook made the comment, uh, her son would like to know what kind of fish might be in that pond. There's a uh, little uh, mosquito fish in here. There are also, there is an invasive species called a cichlid uh, or an African jewel fish. They're, they're pretty, but they are an introduced species in Florida and we would rather that they weren't here. They were introduced on the coast and made their way all the way to the middle of the state where I am right here through the ditches. Florida has a lot of ditches and canals and when you have uh, you know, a hurricane, a big hurricane like Hurricane Irma a few years ago, or a real wet season, all those ditches and, and ponds start connecting to each other when there's so much water. Uh, Alan, uh, you've been out here, you've trapped out here before. Any other fish of mention? Those are the two main ones I see. Um, that pond probably had a higher diversity of fish before the jewelfish entered. Because uh, the jewelfish do eat all the other little fish, and they will eventually eat a lot of tadpoles too. They're they're kind of a problem. So, but that pond may have had like pygmy sunfish or some panfish. It may have even had some gar that would float in and out of there during the wettest part of the season, um, as well as maybe a few catfish here and there. But it really depends on how the water's moving and at what depth or uh, how much rain is going through during the season. I know with the, the trapping that we've done out here before and just coming out with kids trying to find things, uh, that's all we've gotten, just the, um, the cichlids and the little, yeah. uh, little mosquito fish. And, and we do remove them when we catch them. I saw that question pop up. Uh, but we don't actively trap for them. There, there isn't really a management plan in place for Neofiber Pond to get rid of the uh, jewelfish. And that's mainly because they're in every seasonal wetland on the station. Um, so it's, it's a daunting task. 
Okay, thanks for catching that last question, Alan. So let's talk now about that amphiuma. I think everyone, including myself, was super excited about that amphiuma. Um, let's see, um, Andrea Bixler wants to know, what, how bad is a salamander bite? Do we know? We don't want you to find out. <laughs> well, Alan, maybe you could just give a little more of a general description of the amphiumas. Um, and I don't know, maybe you've yeah. even been bit before. I, I haven't been bit, bit, I just hear that it's bad. I haven't been bitten either, but they do have very strong jaws. They grab onto something and hold on. They'll also tear flesh from things. They'll, they'll eat at dead carcasses in the water. Um, and I have had them bite a snake hook. And that bite is a pretty loud crunch. It doesn't sound fun. So I would imagine getting bit by one would leave a bruise. Definitely not something you want to die. But oh boy. Yeah, they're 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 a really neat and thing. So they've got the jaws to handle it. What How one thing I think is cool about them is um, even though they seem a little bit scary, they are good mothers. You don't think of you don't think of amphibians as really being mothers, but when they lay their eggs, uh, typically they stick around until those eggs hatch to protect them. They've also been seen more than once to lay their eggs in abandoned alligator nests. There's probably something about it's the perfect microhabitat and it's nice and, and humid and everything. Um, so they'll also lay them in abandoned alligator nests. Wow. Armando on Facebook wants to know how big the amphiumas get. Alan, oh, I've, I've seen them. Yeah, I've seen them over three feet, uh, but I didn't get close to four. Uh, and they're sexodimorphic, meaning that males and females look different, uh, mainly that the females get a lot larger than the males. So the females can push up to four feet long, and the males will be a lot smaller. So, but on average, I think I've seen them between two and three feet. Wow, that is exciting. Let's see, we have a couple of questions about tadpoles. Zeke wants to know if tadpoles are considered fish. Uh, tadpoles are amphibians. So uh, in a frog's life cycle, the tadpole is like their larval stage. And just like how every frog species is different, every tadpole species is also different. And sometimes the only way you can tell the difference between one tadpole from another by putting them under a microscope and actually looking at those mouthpieces. So, but they are technically amphibians. All right, what do they eat? Vanessa wants to know. They kind of eat everything. We don't really know the extent of their diet. Uh, they're omnivores, meaning they'll, they'll munch on plant matter, they'll eat um, any kind of long insects, and I've even seen them uh, eating on carcasses in the water as well. So they'll like go in and munch on decaying flesh even. They're, they're, they're kind of metal, pretty cool. Sometimes they, they eat each other. <laughs> yeah. Just a couple of days ago uh, when we were out here, we saw one that had another, was carrying another one in its mouth that was just eviscerated. So yeah, they're, they're pretty cool. Everything out here seems to want to eat, eat, eat everything else. And, and that uh, carnivorous and cannibalistic uh, instinct, it, that extends to adulthood too. Frogs will eat smaller frogs. Happens all the time. So. Wow. All right. We have a few questions about some of the plants out there. Patty on Facebook asks, do the Sweet Bay Magnolias flower like a regular magnolia tree? I'm not sure exactly what, what their flower looks like. I'm looking over, I do see another tree with white blooms on it. And that might be another one over there. So I try to think when I've been out here for camp, I don't remember seeing them in bloom. Um, so I don't know, gotta Google it. Yeah, they do, they do have white flowers, the Sweet Bay Magnolia, so. But I, I, I can't really compare them to other magnolia trees. I don't remember their exact petal structure. 
All right. Courtney would like to know, are there any carnivorous plants around that pond, Dustin? We have a carnivorous plant in this area called a pink sundew. They don't like it this deep. You know, each plant has their, their water tolerances. Uh, but if, you, if, if I walked around the edges here, maybe I would find some. They, they're really small, little pink plants, and they're covered with what looks like, like hair with dew on it. They're called, that's why they get their name, sundew. Uh, that dew is, is basically glue, an insect lands on there thinking they're gonna get a sip of water and they're stuck to it and, and then it eats it. <laughs> it's, it's not like a Venus flytrap, um, but it does get all stuck in there and it cur curls up on it and dissolves it and eats it. Sometimes you, when you're looking at them, you'll find little bits of old bugs that are still on there. Okay. Oh, this is a good one from Facebook. Lily asked, is there a difference between toad and frog tadpoles? Um, I mean, there are differences between all the different species of tadpoles, but there isn't really a, there isn't really a difference between toads as a group. There's not a difference between like tadpoles as a group from toads to frogs, but each species, whether it be a southern toad or a green tree frog, will look a lot different from each other. Um, depending on the species, of course. All right, I have a question that it just, it says, what is the stick? So I'm thinking it means this, one of the stick bugs in your video. The water scorpion? Yeah, that was a, a water scorpion. Okay. And they, they do hunt, they're predaceous, uh, and they can look a lot like a stick and you start to swim your little tadpole, swimming close there, and then they got you. It was interesting when it was walking around on Emily's arm, because at first it was, you know, trying to get away, walking around, but then it, it went into a different mode. It went into you can't see me mode, and was just completely still with its, with its front arms out, trying to <laughs> think, okay, they won't see me, I look like a stick. That's how I was able to put my macro lens on my, on my uh, cell phone and take that shot, look like I had a microscope up to it. It was just totally still. It was pretty, uh, it was pretty amazing to see it just, just stand there like that. Yeah, a really interesting thing about those water scorpions, all of them in that family, that they do breathe air, though they spend all their time underwater, or most of it, and they'll carry a little bubble of air with them while they're underwater. And they'll break a piece of their body uh, from the surface. And that like break in tension will refill that air bubble. They can have a continuous stream, almost like a, almost like a little uh, scuba tank. Kind of cool. Okay. Yeah, you can see them stick their, it's kind of like they're sticking their butt or their tail up out of the water, just poking the surface. Yeah. Okay, let's see. We have a question. Do, are, are there a lot of mosquitoes out there, Dustin? I haven't been getting bit by any mosquitoes today. And that's one thing that I like about the scrub. Uh, during the daytime, you just don't have a whole lot of mosquitoes. And even though I'm in the wetland, I'm not, I'm not getting bit right now this time of day. Uh, you do get bit by other things. When I was out here yesterday, I was looking around that sweet bay and had my hand on the bark and uh, I started getting bit by something in a couple different places. What the heck is biting me? And I looked down and I had ants biting me um, and it definitely, it hurt, it wasn't real bad, but it, it stung. And then when I looked close, I could see that there were ants going up patrolling the, the trees. So I assume it was an ant from the tree that was trying to uh, keep me away from the tree. So, so not a lot of mosquitoes, at least not this time of day, but there are uh, other things out here that, that can bite you. And I'm, I'm barefoot, haven't been bitten by anything, but there are certainly things that could, uh, there's, a, there's a beetle here called, or a water bug here called uh, 
a toe biter. <laughs> and I've never gotten bit by one, but occasionally I, I guess somebody will get bit by one of those. I got big pincers. Okay. That sounds scary. Uh, Anna Clark on Facebook asked, are there armored catfish? I haven't personally seen them in that pond, but I've seen them in a lot of the wetlands around there. So it wouldn't surprise me if they made it in there on occasion. So. And Ellen would like to know, are there fire ants out there? Tons of them. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of fire ants. Yeah, I haven't seen any fire ants right here at the pond, um, but they're definitely around this part of Florida. <laughs> We've all, anybody who lives here can attest to that. Okay, great. Well, we have a lot of questions, you guys, but if you need to wrap it up, we can send out our email answering the rest of them. It's, um, I'm okay with sticking on for a bit, uh, but if you're one of the, the viewers, don't feel obligated. Like our, our summer campers, don't feel like you have to keep staying on. But if people are sticking around and have more questions, I'm happy to stick around a little longer. Okay. Well, we'll just keep going then. Sabine asked, do you have a lot of exotic island apple snails? And if yes, have you seen more limpkins? Ooh, um, Alan, you want to take that one? Yeah, I don't see a lot of the invasive apple snails on the station itself. They do exist, but I think uh, because it's not a permanent hydrological source, as in there's not water there all year long, the apple snails don't tend to do as well. Now, where I work here on Buck Island Ranch, where we have permanent water all over the place, there are invasive apple snails everywhere, and we have limpkins everywhere, and we even have snail kites. So, they're, they're a blessing and a curse. <laughs> Uh, Glenn on Facebook wants to know, are there waterways to kayak? No, there aren't any areas to kayak on the station, though sometimes it floods enough that the researchers have to kayak out to sites. There is a beautiful park called Fish Eating, State, Fish Eating Creek State Park, south of Archbold. It's about a 15 minute drive south uh, off of Highway 27. And that ha that's a beautiful place for kayaking. All right, we got a couple of more questions. Uh, after you started talking about the amphiuma, how does the salamander extrude slime? Oh, wow. Um, I have through their skin, but I imagine they actually have an, I imagine they have an organ for that, but I really don't know. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, but it is, they do, it is put out through the skin. I just don't know if there's an organ or gland that keeps it. I don't know what that's called. And if you, if you start looking around on YouTube and watching videos of people catching amphiumas uh, who, who actually handle them, you'll, you'll see they can put out a, a lot of that you know, snot. <laughs> uh, I, I try not to handle animals if I, if I can help it. I'm already disturbing them a little bit by being out here and by catching them. And particularly salamanders have very sensitive skin. So if you're touching a salamander, you don't wanna get the chemicals from your hand on the salamander, especially if I've got sunscreen on me. So I just put it in the net and, and then let it go. But if I had been grabbing onto it, it would have been producing a lot more of that slime. All right. Kathy wants to know, what's the function of those tiny toes on that salamander? Um, they don't serve a whole lot of function now. Uh, it may assist in breeding. Uh, we think that they're just slowly going away. Those limbs will eventually be completely useless and they'll be similar, similar to how whales still have a little bit of bone left where there were legs many, many years ago. Uh, but they don't really serve too much of a purpose now. There's also a sand skink that's a, a rare species that lives around here in the sand. And it also has vestigial arms and legs, just the same, same thing. They look very similar to the amphiuma ones, T 
teeny tiny ones. And they, they live under the sand uh, and they actually are swimming under the sand. When you find their tracks, it looks like a little, um, an S curve as they're swimming around under the sand. Very cool. Renee wants to know how you get the traps. You can order traps from a lot of different places. You can even go to things like Bass Pro or similar shops and buy traps. They're pretty inexpensive. And they range in size from like little minnow traps like that to traps big enough to catch alligators, but probably don't want to buy anything that big. Okay. And you may have answered this when you were talking about the carnivorous plants. Uh, are there any pitcher plants or Venus fly traps out there, Dustin? Not, not right not, this one. Oh, sorry. Go for it, Alan. <laughs> uh, just not, not, not right there, but pretty, pretty close north, right in Polk County, there are, um, there are pitcher plants. All right. About how many ponds are out there, Dustin? Levi, I would like to know. We, we answered that uh, at one of our other virtual field trips when Mandy, one of the researchers, was on. <laughs> I was trying to remember. I think it was over 600. It, it's some crazy huge number. We have about 9,000 acres here. It's something like 600. Maybe it was even higher than that. And they can be, they can be real small. What's that, Alan? I'm embarrassed that I can't remember the, the amount of ponds. But yeah, I, I think it is over 600. It's a lot, a lot of ponds. It's a lot. Let's see, have you ever seen key deer out there? We are too far north. To get to the keys is still, uh, you still gotta drive, I don't know, at least three hours probably. So we are, some would call this South Florida. But Florida's pretty long, so there's still, there's still a ways to go to get down there. I would love if we had those here. We just have, uh, we have deer, just regular, uh, um, regular deer. white tail deer. Oh, okay. Going back to the arrowhead plant, can it make any kind of food? What kind of food could it make? Yeah, if, if you look up uh, online, you, you can see recipes for this, and it might be listed as wapato or listed as uh, duck potato, and you basically treat it like a potato. The outer part is real bitter, but you can just peel that out. You can eat it, but you can just peel that outer part off and then boil it or roast it, or the same things that you would do with potato. Uh, now, I've never done this myself, but I've, I've done a lot of reading about it and watched videos of other people doing these things. I really want to do this someday. And this is not the, the primary species where people do that with. That's, um, this, this does have the tubers, but the other one that normally called, gets called Wapato is uh, Sagittaria latifolia which is the broad-leafed arrowhead you do need to be careful because there is another species called the uh what is it uh arum i think it is which is poisonous it's not in the same genus as this it's it's not it's not the, it's not related but it looks a lot like it so don't just go and start digging things up really make sure you know what you're digging up before you get into wild foraging Oh boy. All right, let's see. We're winding down our questions. Bill would like to know what species of snakes you've seen in the pond. Well, I keep seeing uh, ribbon snakes. I've seen two of them in the last week, but uh, Alan, why don't you jump in on that? Yeah, that, that pond has ribbon snakes. It has uh, banded water snakes. It has green water snakes. Um, It'll also have, you know, visitors like rat snakes and corn snakes. Uh, it may even get an occasional rattlesnake that'll come down there to get a drink of water. Uh, and I suspect that that pond has mud snakes, but I haven't seen one yet. But a mud snake is a really cool, mostly aquatic snake that actually loves to eat amphiumas. And they kind of share the same habitat. So 
I imagine with all the amphiumas in that wetland, there are probably some mud snakes in there munching away. But pretty much any snake in that area will come down to that wetland to drink as well. So I'm sure it gets, it's gotten every visitor, visitor imaginable. And, and we think that there's mud turtles in here too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are definitely Florida mud turtles. Um, and there are probably the other species of probably striped and common musk. They're probably in there too. There might even be a snapper or two in there, maybe. Watch your toes then, Dustin. <laughs> All right, let's see. What are the trees called behind you, Dustin? Okay, we've got these big tall pine trees right here. These are slash pines. And when I'm looking around, that's pretty much what I am seeing everywhere. They look a lot like longleaf pine and truthfully, they're very difficult to tell apart. But I'm, I just know that we don't have longleaf pines in this part of our property, so that these are all slash pine. They have papery bark and they hold, their, they hold their branches really high as a fire strategy. Because we have a lot of, uh, historically there was a lot of wildfires and today even now we do a lot of prescribed burns. So they, they can hold those branches up high, they dry off the lower branches. When a fire comes through, that bark protects it and they can withstand many fires in their lifetime. There's a, there's a cultural heritage too where this part of Florida there was a lot of turpentining actually throughout throughout Florida and, and in the generally in the southeast in general. There's a lot of turpentining where um, it's kind of like like uh, tapping trees for maple syrup. It's a little bit like that. And logging as well. So this whole area in here, uh, not well, not right here because I'm on Archbold property. This wasn't logged, but all the areas around here were logged. All right. Armando would like to know, are there non-native cichlids at Archbold? Yep, yeah, we, uh, we talked a little bit about that earlier, those, those uh, African jewel fish. We do have them, they're right around me right here. All right, and oh, Lily wanted to know on Facebook if the salamander would dry out if it stays in the sun too long. It would. It definitely needs moisture. All right, we have one more from Ellen. Are cottonmouth snakes common out there? I don't see a lot of cottonmouth on the station. When I think about it, I don't think I've ever seen one on the station's property. They don't tend to like those seasonal wetlands. They prefer they prefer them. They prefer uh, uh, more permanent sources of water. So off the bridge, I see them a lot more, but directly on the station or in, in the scrub, I don't see them at all. Okay, well, I think we have answered all of your questions and I, I apologize everybody if I've missed one, but we will get to it when we go through all of the chat questions and send out our follow-up email. So is there anything else that you'd like to say, Dustin? I'm just so grateful to have people who want to spend part of their morning coming out on a virtual field trip. I know it's not the same as being out here and having your toes in the water, but I, I just love that you're here and you're showing up to do these things. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Yes, thanks so much, Alan, too. Well, all right, everybody. Awesome. We had another great time today. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Next Tuesday morning, tune in again as Dustin will take us on a field trip to a Florida cattle ranch. And this Thursday at 3.30 p.m., our special distinguished guest speaker, Dr. John Fitzpatrick, will present How Birds Can Save the World. Lessons from eBird, the world's largest citizen science project. Thanks again, everybody, for coming.